Okay, so this is the fifth video lecture um, on lifespan development, and as promised, I wanted to talk about Harlow, which is basically what this image is about. Uh, this is a really famous uh, research study done on attachment, and the experiment went something like, um, and the answer to the quiz question is, the experiment he has, um, he gives these monkeys, uh, these are, I forget what kind they are, but anyway, um, he's able to demonstrate that food is not a sufficient is not sufficient for attachment and um, development. And so one group of monkeys, he, he offers them um, a mother monkey that's covered in terry cloth and a mother monkey that it has a bottle that offers food. And then he exposes the monkeys to this uh, diabolicals, this uh, scary creature, and he watches, or he watches that the babies run not to the monkey with the wire and the food, but to the terry cloth monkey, even though the terry cloth monkey can't offer the baby any food. And so from this, he concludes that what is most important to development is not food, but it is contact comfort. And this is actually a quiz question in my human growth and development class is what is more important to development and attachment? And it is not food, but it is contact comfort. So basically in the monkey kingdom, at least babies will choose um, to be nurtured and held um, over food uh, and sustenance. Okay, really important topic is parenting styles. Uh, I spent a lot more time talking about this in my marriage and family class actually uh, but one of the one of the more conventional ways to think about parenting is that we have these three different styles authoritarian authoritative and permissive I don't I don't ask you to necessarily know which one is which but what I think is more important is that you understand how they differ and this philosophy on parenting says is that Parenting styles can be thought of as the relationship between responsiveness and demands. So responsiveness is a child asks for something. They ask for money or time or attention or affection, and you respond. You respond by giving them your attention or love or whatever it is that they seem to be requesting, right? Demands are parental expectations, are things like, rules and chores, are you strict? So a responsive parent would be one who uh, basically gives a kid what they want or what they need. Um, a parent who has high demands would be like a strict parent. And so these three different parenting styles are the, um, how they differ is their ratio of responsiveness to demands. Do they give their children things, time, attention, money, whatever, affection, and what do they expect in return? One style, and I always have to look at it, um, that's the authoritarian, that's this first one with an N, um, this one right here. This is the strict parent, right? He has the strict parent asks lots of demands, but doesn't give anything in return, no responsiveness. Lots of expectations, lots of rules, but no responses, no, uh, maybe no privileges or no attention, these kinds of things. The permissive parent on the bottom, that's this one over here, this is the parent that gives everything but has very few expectations in return, right? Excessive permissiveness, no expectations. Give you whatever you want. I don't, um, I don't hold you accountable for your grades. I don't hold you accountable for your attitude. You know, this is the kid where, this is the household where the kids just run amok. This is the household, the authoritarian is the household where, you know, it's run by a, uh, by a cold, stoic drill sergeant kind of spoke. The best one, and that's why it's got a star on here. And when I say the best one, I mean the one based that the research supports that that the children that have the greatest overall well-being um, have the better social skills come out of parenting styles like this one. And that is the one that has high expectations and high responses. Like you give your kid what your kids want, what they ask for, but I expect a lot in return, right? You set rules, you hold, you hold your children accountable, but you also respond to their requests for attention, to their, to their privileges, to their requests for things, right? So it's this mutual, yeah, that's all I have to say about that, right? You have clear, you have high, clear expectations, but your kids can also expect a lot from you. Um, in return. So it's, um, I, I think this is a more, I might ask you which, what is the combination uh, that's considered the best or even how these styles differ, 
but I find that they're so close in name, I find them hard to even keep straight. And then the other one that's not even mentioned in your textbook, that's the uninvolved parent. That's the parent that doesn't do anything. They don't have any expectations. They don't respond. They're just like completely, you know, not involved. They're just kind of not there. That's, the, that's probably the worst kind, actually. Okay, so adolescence. I actually really like to talk about adolescence um, because, uh, well, yeah, I just like to talk about adolescence. For one thing, adolescence is a cultural, uh, it's a cultural phenomenon. Not all cultures have this period or the stage in our development between childhood and adulthood. In some cultures, you are a child and then you are an adult. But we have, and in, in many of the uh, more industrialized societies, societies with privilege, we have this this period where you are neither adult nor uh, nor child. It's also a potentially really confusing time because you're neither adult nor child, right? Act your age. Well, how exactly is a 15 year old supposed to act? And our culture has this very broad, um, like some children in the age of 15 are given lots of privileges. Other children at the age of 15 are given virtually no privileges. So where you're at relative to all of your peers can also be very confusing. And I would argue, you know, parents even find it confusing. There's even a lot of disagreements about how, how parents should be towards their adolescents. For our purposes, this is the period that is that goes from the from puberty, and that's when your body begins to sexualize, right? So that's a physical, that's a nature, that's a nature de maturation phenomena into whenever we call them adulthood. And so that's another question: When are you an adult, right? What exactly? So some textbooks will go will say that adolescence runs anywhere between say twelve and twenty. <laughs> That's a pretty big period in there, or 12 and 22, right? Um, so anyway, but that's one of the reasons it's so uh, confusing. Another important thing to know about lifespan development is your brain develops from the back to the front. I may have said this in another chapter. So the part of your brain, your cerebellum, the part of your brain that's about physical balance and manipulating your body through space, it develops first. The last part of your brain is your frontal lobe. So sometimes adolescents get accused of being very, um, they're accused of being uh, emotional or they don't, or, or uh, they don't think through things. Well, I would argue that they're really not any more emotional than anybody else. That what has not yet happened is the frontal lobe that controls their emotional expression is not fully formed. So by the time you're 35, right, when 25 or so is when your frontal lobe fully develops, you're controlling, you're managing um, how your emotions that are happening in your limbic system. Adolescents just don't have that kind of brain development yet. Uh, so it's kind of unfair. So as the frontal lobe develops, then we move to things like moral reasoning, this, this abstract concept of right and wrong. Uh, this is also a period of what's referred to as identity formation. You know, think about when you were in the seventh and the eighth grade, um, which may be a long time ago for some of you and not very long ago for others. You know, how did you, how did you dress? What kind of music did you listen to? If you're like a typical American, we go through this stage in our adolescence of really trying out different things, trying out different kinds of dress, trying out different music, different friend groups, different sort of hobbies. And that's all because of this, because of identity formation. This is a perfectly normal, expected thing to do during this stage of life, to try out lots of different things and partly because it's safe and what I mean by safe is when we get older and we have a mortgage and a career to think about and maybe we have our own children to take care of we can't really be experimenting with who I am you know what am I that kind of thing we have to it's safe to do during adolescence it's what we're supposed to be doing I've heard it described as it's a time of risks and opportunities um, yeah, so because, yeah, because it's safe. So try out lots of different things during adolescence. And I'm going to stop this one. And in the next slide, I will talk about um, adulthood.